Toolshed is a platform, a project, and a place in Hudson, New York, where artists Susanna Saylor and Edward Morris collect and share tools for ecological living. They have categorized these tools into four distinct groups: food, kin, shelter, and magic. Today, we talk about kinship and shelter, and because I couldn't help myself, magic. With the support of the Graham Foundation for Advanced Studies in the Fine Arts, we speak to Susanna and Edward about what ecological living means and how Toolshed fits into that. We also talk in detail about the Toolshed Exchange, a tool lending library that fosters kinship, creates a sense of ownership, and builds a self-supporting community. I am Vaishnavi Shukla and this is Architecture Off Center, a podcast where we highlight contemporary discourses that shape the built environment but do not occupy the center stage in our daily lives. We speak to radical designers, thinkers and change makers who are deeply engaged in redefining the way we live and interact with the world around us. I'm going to start with your logo today. and um, the tool shed logo is a line drawing a silhouette of you know what kids draw as a house or a home and within that is another home and it's a home within a home within a home um can you talk a little bit about the logo of the tool shed and lead us into the story behind tool shed Yeah sure so the logo we should give credit where credit is due that was designed by a woman we work with a lot named Jill Allen Peterson and the logo is as you just described a home within a home within a home within a home and the idea is that there's sort of this infinite regress of homes and that image captures an idea of ecology that we have that we'll i think discuss at length probably mm. in this interview um essentially it captures the idea that ecology is all about relations and that there's no single situated home that's a firm boundary against all other places um but we'll return to that in more detail in a sec i think let's let's maybe get into the story of how tool shed developed and and come back to these more complicated ideas of ecology that we really want to express with the project um so ed and i are artists um we primarily work with lens based uh media and also do some installation work as well um and for most of our career we've worked pretty much exclusively on issues around ecology and the ecological crisis um that we're facing and in addition to working as artists we've always had um a sort of side it's not a side but a a joint um uh project with socially engaged work um mm. and platform building. So when we um started we initiated a project called the Canary Project and that was um art and media to deepen public understanding of climate change and it was really a collective. We worked with hundreds of artists and designers and educators and developed projects across many different media that were really about messaging and, and warning about climate change at a time when there was not as broad an understanding of the science as there is now. Um and so I guess it was about 5 years ago we started feeling like it was time to evolve from that metaphor of the canary and the coal mine that metaphor of warning and working as artists and with artists other artists and media makers around that initiative um to something that uh was more focused on local ecologies and it you know it was it took a couple of years this evolution from the previous work as canary we it was a 10 year project um but uh that's sort of the background or the the history that led us to to establish tool shed hmm. um yes so you want to hear about more about the logo <laughs> i promised that in the beginning <laughs> um well just because i think there's a lot more to explain in terms of the word ecology I, i think the word ecology is is one of these words that 
you hear all the time and it is enjoying a vogue at the moment and those mm. words tend to get exhausted a little bit so um i would love to refresh the word a little bit um by going back to its roots uh so as many people may know ecology is built out of two words in greek one is oikos which means literally home it's the mm. same root that we have in economy and the other part of the root is logos. Logos is a very interesting word. It's, it's, it can mean wor literally word, or it can mean kind of uh, an inner logic, or in the Christian tradition, divine reason for something. But all together kind of means language. So ecology mm -hmm. means the language of home. Mm -hmm. um, but, and that's why we're talking about homes within homes within homes. Mm -hmm. But then when you think about what actually a home could be, um, I think it's important to or at least we think about ecology from from two points of two main kind of intellectual threads call them one is the thread of umwelt hmm. um so um an umwelt is a concept developed by jacob von uxel an early german biologist that again is getting a lot of currency in the culture right now most prominently by, with a book by ed young called the immense world i think is hmm. a, a contemporary book that picks this concept up in a really accessible way but the umwelt is literally the environment of a particular being. And the most famous example he gives is of a tick. Um, this is, Uxel gives this example of a tick, which has, which the entire world of a tick is limited to three things, heat, light, and a sense of butyric acid, whatever that is. Um, it's blood. It's basically blood. <laughs> but, and, and without those three things, the tick doesn't move. Once those three things, when any one of those three things are activated and the tick moves in certain ways, right? And the point being is that as you work through different species in the world, each has its own umwelt, is sensing different things, is reacting to different things, is perceiving the world in different ways. And so once you start thinking in this way, you realize that the fly that's buzzing around your house and the dog that you have as a pet aren't perceiving the same home in the same way, mm -hmm. right? Um, and you can even extend that into humans. Like the way Susanna perceives the home is not exactly the same way as I perceive the home. So that's why there's these homes within a home within a home. The other key concept for us um, that that I think extends this idea of umwelt beyond the biological world is Felix Guattari's concept of three ecologies. So Guattari took this word ecology, understood its relevance back in 1989 when he published the book, um, and understood that there were three registers for ecology. There's the natural ecology, what we normally think of. Like when people hear the word ecology, they normally think of like frogs and fishes or some kind of diagram that they dimly remember from some class in grade school with you know, arrows and mm. things cycling around like a hydro um, hydrology cycle or something. Um, but he, he applies that same concept of ecology to not only the natural world, but social ecologies, and then I think most interestingly, mental ecologies. So the the way that different ideas exist within the head. Mm. So we took that idea very much to heart with Toolshed when we started thinking about ecology and how we could gather and share tools for living ecologically. Well, living ecologically means something different in those three registers. Mm. And because you, sorry, go ahead, Susanna. I guess I just wanted to add to that um, in terms of like, a, a transformation or an evolution of human beings' um, umwelts, uh, um, this recognition of, at least in the Western world, the human umwelt is being um, highly developed as a defense against the umwelts of other creatures, you mm. know, uh, and in everything from the structures we build, um, which are not very porous, um, to the way that we regard the natural environment as um, a kind of other wild place or pristine place or a place to be protected or, you know, a place that we aren't necessarily situated in as 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 part of an inter integral to. So um in the in thinking about the framework of tool such certainly um trying to make a, a shift a cultural shift in how we message around these ideas of um the the human umwelt and our um, broader ecology that connects to other non-human beings so before we get a little kind of deeper into tool shed and since you've touched upon a lot of theoretical frameworks i was wondering how or 
you know, how one can think about ecology in relation to the idea of environment. So while a particular ecology exists within a certain environment, it might not necessarily be true vice versa. I'm just trying to think about it more from a systems thinking perspective where an ecology, when you think about it, is something that always, as you said, has certain kind of relationship going on. In that framework of thinking about relationships and ecology, where do you think about environment? And that doesn't have to do, of course, with like a natural environment, but you mentioned the social ecology, the mental ecology, and where does the the idea, the very broad idea of environment uh, fold into? Well, an environment, when you speak of an environment, you speak of an envelope, essentially. You're talking about regarding a certain area. Um, and just as with ecology, we don't think about there being one single ecology. Um, there's not one single environment, right? The, the word environment as a general term is almost meaningless in a way. Um, it, it, when people talk about environmentalism or caring about the environment, it's hard to understand what that actually means when you think about it, because there's not a singular environment. Right. Uh, as I just said, the environment of the chick is very different than the environment, the human being or the fly or the human. Mm -hmm. um, but but there are these different envelopes. Uh, and it's the same with ecology. You, want to, you, you kind of have to think about what your frame of reference is and how wide that is. So there's these co-centric circles. Um, I suppose ultimately you can end up with the environment of the earth, the environment that's enclosed by the atmosphere of the earth. Um, but I think it's it's more useful to think more locally about environments, to draw that envelope more narrowly. And probably the 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 this movement towards thinking about bioregionalism rather than um uh you know this town, that town, or the earth mm. as a big picture, I think is a very productive movement. Hmm. Yeah, and in in fact, I mean, I, I may go further to say that yeah, I think that the idea of environmentalism has um, it's it's in some ways estranged us from the world because it's uh, allowed um, cultural generalizations about what an environment is, which tends to be like a pristine environment far away, um, you know, perhaps where polar bears live and so on, or mm. in a, you know, Sierra Club calendar. Um, and so sort of, I think, trying to um, dig into what we mean by the environment and 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 be more kind of specific about it, um, bioregionalism, um, or thinking about ecologies and relationships um, is very productive. Mm. So, okay, we'll, we'll get into tool shed now because you you mentioned the the region instead of instead of the boundaries and this is a particular project that is located in a specific geography in a specific place so if you were to talk about tool shed how would you describe it one as a, a project um that that exists physically and two as an idea that has these wonderful um four categories and then we can dive deeper yeah so so as we said the mission of toolshed is to gather and share tools for living ecologically or being ecological and that platform exists in three different ways and two of which are very local and one of which is more uh, sort of global or media based um and you know as susanna mentioned this th this emphasis on where we live and being local was very important in the origins of toolshed so um, the two concrete on the ground local projects are a collection of tools that we lend out, which is a tool lending library, and then a collection of books and objects, which exists in a public mm -hmm. library. Um, and then these two locally situated physical locations, they have physical locations, um, uh, those, two, those two entities spin off programming like workshops and speaking events and so on yeah the that latter part of the equation is is really important to to tool shed um because there's a lot that happens within the tool lending library or the ecotopian collection which is the collection of books and objects that we made um in collaboration with the artist mary mattingly 
um, there's a lot of interactions that happen in those places that we're not necessarily even involved in. They're, they become their own um, sites of social interaction, uh, which is, is really wonderful. Um, and in, in addition to that, we have various workshops um, throughout the year that um, sometimes are really uh, nuts and bolts, like training people uh, how to be more self-sufficient and using um, tools or building. Um, and other times they'll be more focused on um, arts uh, initiatives. Uh, for example, we had a wonderful workshop with the artist Ellie Irons, um, where she taught the participants how to make pigments from uh, what she describes as feral plants. So the kinds of plants that grow up through the cracks and city sidewalks or, or flowers that she would find in um, you know, roadside fields. Uh, and um, I would say right now our biggest uh, project going on in that nature is a watershed restoration project on the Skullay Creek with um, the artist Tim First now. Uh, where we're working to establish willow trees on a um, creek bed. Mm -hmm. And the social interaction part and the workshop part is something that I want to um, talk about a little bit. So um, when when I was at the GSD and we hosted uh, the International Women's Week, the the theme that we chose to focus on during that week was kinship. And that is something that I, as one of your categories, found very interesting is that, um, of course, it's a place, it's a tool lending library, it's, it, it has all these events, but at the crux of it is these social interactions, which at a community level have a certain effect. And the way you look at kinship and the way you look at shelter is through this, through this medium is is very interesting. It's very, very exciting. How do you think of kinship um, with with reference to the tool shed? Yeah. So as you mentioned, there's there's four categories where we're gathering and sharing these tools: food, kin, shelter, and magic. And to focus on kinship, because essentially kinship could be a category that all the tools belong to, because that is the most fundamental at the at the core most fundamentally what we're trying to do is expand the idea of who and what is kin and what belongs in your ecology, what belongs in the home that you're defining for yourself. Um, and um, so so at all levels, that's what we're trying to do with Toolshed. And that happens at a very basic level, simply with the borrowing of tools, just on that basic mechanical level. Because if you need something done, um, and you don't look for that tool in your house or buy it for yourself to own for yourself, but you go somewhere where there's a shared resource, a commons, you're already expanding your notion of what your home mm. is. Mm. Um, so even on that level, even on that sort of transactional level, I feel like there's something happening in terms of shaping your idea of kin, who, who belongs in your home, who do you rely on, um, et cetera. But then, of course, as you mentioned, in these social interactions, when you have you know, it's always interesting to see who comes to these workshops. <laughs> so you hold a workshop on Mohican ideas of the willow and how willow was used in the Mohican tradition, and you just don't know who's going to show up. And the, the older people show up and kids show up and people you've never seen before show up. I think that's, to me, is part of the main point. I mean, Hudson, where we live, is a pretty small city. It's a city. There's only 8,000 people who live here. It's because of how dense it is. Mm. And Lo and behold, here's 25 people I've never seen before. And now we're relating to each other in a room and focused on a plant or whatever it is, learning some skill and our notions of kin really expand. So that's how it expands on a social, eco on a social ecological level. But then on a natural ecological level, our idea of kin is also expanding because say one of the workshops that we did is on how to make pigments from plants that grow around here. Plants that sometimes we think of as weeds, right? Mm -hmm. That actually have some kind of something to offer. You know, that that language around plants being invasive species or weeds is a pretty strange discourse. Mm -hmm. It's not far from that to make America great again in a way. <laughs> you know, it's like, <laughs> they're all welcome. All plants are welcome. And, and all of a sudden you start to see this plant that you thought of as 
either you didn't see it because it's just a plant or you thought of it as a weed and now you see it's a chokeberry that has a purple color that you can make a nice watercolor out of. It really changes your relationship to that plant. It starts expanding this idea of a kinship relation. Yeah, I think what Ed said about the commons is really fundamental to the way that Toolshed thinks about kin and how can we within communities or, you know, within our neighborhoods, um, create a sense of a commons, um, even if it's a, a simple, simple thing of a tool lending library, um, and, and activate that really. Hmm. And <laughs> I mean, at, at this point, it probably sounds a little silly, but I think the tool shed as a project and the tool lending library is also so economical <laughs> in a certain way, you know, <laughs> um, <laughs> rather than everyone, you know, kind of stuffing up their garages with tools that they might need once in a decade it just seems so much more economical to have a shared resource like a place where you can get the tools that you want to you borrow it for your tasks you return them and it's, it's the same thing that somebody else can borrow and use it but it's also very very economical yes. uh, absolutely and that's definitely a part of the motivation not just for individuals but also for organizations in town so um one of the primary um the foundational activities that we engaged with when we were thinking about starting Toolshed was having interviews with leaders of different nonprofits in town. And, you know, even in the nonprofit space, you get, you, there is a, an undercurrent of kind of capitalist competitiveness where you're trying to take market share from someone else. You can get those grants and so on. It's natural. Yeah. It happens. It's not yeah. blaming anybody, but it's just, that's an atmosphere that occurs. But here with Toolshed, we're saying, look, let's think about resources that we can share. We're all on the same page. We're all trying to fight the same fight. How can we, we're not going to start a nonprofit that does what you're doing. We're going to start a nonprofit that helps what you're doing. Um, and so um, just on that level, yes, it's economical for individuals, but it's also economical for you yeah. know, organizations that are trying to make the most out of limited resources. And, and the last, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, one concrete example there is like a lot of cities um, were trying to build, uh, plant more trees in Hudson. And, we're, and and that has to do not only just with making the city more beautiful, but of course, to combat uh, rising temperatures. And the heat island effect. The heat mm -hmm. island effect. And mm -hmm. so there's a lot of tree planting going on. And uh, so whenever this happens, um, the organizations that are working on it need a whole bunch of shovels, you know, and it's just this oh, like they get it from <laughs> practical thing that like, you know, where are they going to come from? Because we're gathering 20 people to work today to plant some trees. And um, so that's a concrete example of when uh, some of the local organizations reach out to us and are like, can we have some shovels for our tree planting next weekend? So. But, but also the fact that, you know, a tool that you're using and knowing that it has been used by someone previously, that it's, well, pre-owned in this case belongs to an organization, but that it has all these, um, it's associated with all these people who, who've held it in their hands, you know, have taken care of it so that the person after them can use it in a nice way, kind of taken ownership or responsibility for that tool, kind of made sure that it gets back in the place, ready for the next person. It's just in that sense also, there's something a little more beautiful about, about taking responsibility for something to kind of, you know, make sure that there's certain upkeep involved. And in that process also, I somehow feel like something that's lived in somebody else's house is then coming and living in your house before you pass it on and, you know, goes, lives in somebody else's house after that. So it's, it's this thing that if, you know, like you're fostering <laughs> yeah, for a bit and then it just, it, it goes on to live another life. It was very, very beautiful. You know, I, I never thought of it quite that way before, but that's really beautiful. And it's, of course it's true. Uh, and, and you have, some people will borrow tools a lot of people borrow tools, and, and if there's some slight thing that needs to happen to it, um, some slight repair, a lot of people do those repairs themselves yeah. and bring that. And yeah. it's, so it's it is really building a kind of like you say mutual responsibility and that that legacy that sort of shadow of the previous user is a really beautiful idea. Yeah, I mean it's like taking a a nice well read book from a library and you know somebody has read it before and has probably left a little note or taken good care of it and if it's a very well loved book you know you might take the responsibility to go get it 
you know, rebound and put it back in, in good shape. So in that sense, happening with tools, which is just so functional, you know, you don't get emotionally attached to your tools. I mean, you probably do if you're in the, in the trade, but other than that, it just means to get something done, you know, fix something, uh, to, to give it that life, I thought was, was quite ingenious, but also very, very practical. <laughs> That's really cool. Yeah, I miss that aspect of libraries. I don't know if you remember, but libraries used to have, you know, like a card in it. Yeah, with all yeah. The borrowers' names. I've gotten yeah. rid of those. They just scan it. And you don't ever see that anymore. But I used to love looking at all the little names that had borrowed it before. Yeah, yeah. it used to happen in my undergrad before they went all digital in the new like physical library. So they updated that systems. And I would, by the time I was in my thesis, I borrowed a book that apparently... I had borrowed in my first year and this was fifth year and there's only like <laughs> one other person who had signed after my name. I could tell the book was not popular and just to see my own name five years ago. Um, yeah, they don't they don't do that anywhere. You just know it's on hold or it's being lent and you never know when it's going to come back. So that's, that's even more beautiful. <laughs> that's like interacting the previous version of yourself. Talk about mental <laughs> ecology. Like I could tell my people. handwriting had changed. I could tell my sign had changed. I could tell I was reading the book very differently. But yeah. Um, uh, speaking about books and writing, you have a new book coming up. You've been working on it. Um, tell us more about about the book. And I know it's a culmination of a lot of your your previous work and a lot of things that you've been exploring and topics you've been um, working on? Yeah, so the book is, 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 is actually in its early stages, but the concept of the book, it's for Toolshed, and it's called uh, Recipes for Being Ecological. It'll, it's called Home Within Homes, Recipes for Being Ecological. And the idea here is that it'll be formatted exactly like a cookbook. Mm. So it'll be organized in these four chapters, food, kin, shelter, and magic. Um, and it'll be ideas for how it is that you connect with something else, what, your neighbors, uh, another species, the soil. Um, and that each of the recipes will in some way help you be more ecological or live more ecologically. Um, everything from recipes for how you start a tool library, because it's very easy to do, actually. It can be done on different scales, mm. a tool library, to walking with intention or even meditation. So things that are very easy, things that are more challenging, and we'll have time budgets for those things as well. Um, and then each of those recipes will end with an account of a user of that recipe. And those accounts will will, will get guest contributors for those. Um, so it's a, it's, it's, it's designed as a, a tool. The book itself is designed very practically as a tool. You can pick up this book and get ideas for how you can be more ecological. So that's another way that we're gathering and sharing. And the idea of um, having a lot of contributors is um, comes out of this sense that you know we've been working on these issues for many years and we've along the way, you know, develop this in, incredible kind of group or ecosystem of collaborators and friends and, and people who um, have have uh, thought about these issues a lot and have, you know, personal narratives to contribute about how they've found their way through particular methodologies to being more connected ecologically and wanting to not only like share the tools, but share those stories as well. That was supposed to be the last question, but I have one, <laughs> one more. We spoke about the four categories. We spoke about food, kin, shelter. I want to talk about magic <laughs> and what magic means to you and what magic could look like. Yeah, that's the wild card. And, and, and I, we always, I always get a smile from whoever I'm talking to when I enumerate the categories. I always end with magic because then people sort of light up when they hear about <laughs> magic. And I think, that's, I think that's telling. I think it's telling because I think there's a great desire. Whatever magic might mean to somebody, there's a great desire for it um, out there. And I think that has to do with the fact that the word magic encapsulates certainly enchantment but in itself connection, <laughs> you know, a lot of these terms are redundant. Kin is redundant to magic. And there's sort of every cat, every tool that we isolate could be seen as magic and everyone could be seen as tool and as, as kin inducing. Um, but yeah, magic, magic means um, something you can't understand that can't be explained. 
Um, so magic is a space of unknowing, but it's always at this core um, something that's transformative, something that changes. And when you start to look at the world ecologically, you realize that those transformations are incredibly constant, incredibly manifold, and incredibly unexplained. Um, mm. And so we're trying to carve out this space culturally where it's not an anti-science place at all. I can't emphasize that enough. It's it's not a it's not some antithesis to the Enlightenment, but it is a complement to science. It's understanding that science, data, that kind of understanding takes us so far. But ultimately, ecological understanding is an emotional kind of understanding. And that begins when you start to appreciate all the magic out there. So, so yes, yeah, so a magic spiritual, magic transformation, magic's enchantment, and it's the tools for feeling that, experiencing that, and understanding that. Susan, I want yeah. to know what you think about it as well. Yeah, I was just thinking about um, this idea of tuning. Um, our, our friend Tim Morton, who uh, we hope will contribute to the book, uh, who's a contemporary philosopher and um, one of the founders of the object-oriented ontology movement. Um, so Tim talks about um, tuning to objects or non-human beings. And um, and I really like that sense because it, it you know, it, it takes it almost to uh, a musical sense of of connection um of, of making a personal connection to like um allowing yourself to um open and and tune to um the non-human and i i and it's very i think magical that that idea that um one could do that out in the world um so yeah i just i wanted to add that i don't think we've ever and i don't know we've done 46, 47 episodes across five seasons have ever spoken about magic. And I'm starting to think about why we don't speak about magic. Is there inherently, do we think, have we started thinking that magic is, as you said, is non-scientific? Do we have started people thinking that it's it's kind of like an antidote to the, to the larger discourse, which is very rational, everything that explains that, everything that has a logic, but that's probably something that we all need to think about is, you know, what does, what does magic mean for us? Does it have a place in our lives, whatever shape, form, way that it exists? And I mean, I'm thinking about it right now, but maybe this is what I'll kind of mull over tonight, but. <laughs> oh, completely. There's so much more to say on it. I mean, it, in some ways, magic is the abject of the academy. And, and it's like, you're almost ashamed to talk about magic mm -hmm. in an academic setting. And yet everyone has magic and everyone's so delighted to engage the topic. So um, yeah, there's a lot there. <laughs> and and somehow in like the, the creative fields, even though people don't talk about like shy away from talking about magic and you talk about creativity every time, once you see something like a piece that is very moving, something that you have a reaction to, if you ever were to like write a review about whether it's a filmmaker, whether it's it's a musician, an artist, you would say, oh, the work was magical, you know? So you always use it as an adjective, but you never really use it um, more actively as a verb. You know, you never think about creating magic. It's just something that happens. It's it's something that's unexplained, but wow, this could be an episode about magic. <laughs> sure, <laughs> we'll circle back to that. <laughs> well, Edward and Susanna, thank you so much. Uh, it was lovely talking to you and all the very best for your book. Thank you so much. Thank Thanks you. for having us. This was us. really fun. Thank you. Special thanks to Ayushi Thakur for the research and design support and Kahan Shah for the background score. You can follow us on Instagram at Arc of Center and reach out to us through our website arcofcenter.com. That is A R C H O F F C E N D R E. And thanks for listening.